Hi, everybody. This is Hondo Carpenter, your Sports Illustrated beat writer covering the Las Vegas Raiders. I'm also the host of the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We want to get right into today's podcast. It's a busy week. Obviously, the offseason program is going on. We're two weeks out, a little bit less than two weeks, actually, um, from the start of the NFL draft. And we want to really dig in get in and get involved in reading a bunch of your emails. We've got a lot of really good ones. I want to just remind you, when you go to Spartan Nation Mail, M-A-I-L at yahoo.com, you can email me, put in the subject line, uh, Raiders Q&A. There are several people now that have been bumped to the spam folder because you put Raiders Q&A in your emails and they're not questions. It's comments, it's thoughts, and does it, we want to read those, but Raiders Q and a goes to a specific place that gets read. And I want you to know you've been put in spam because you didn't listen. So I, I'm sorry about that, but we've warned you lots of times. So only use Raiders Q and a, if you are, um, have an actual question in your email comment, whatever, it then gets filtered as okay. People are spamming. It gets handled. So please do that because of the voluminous amount of mail we get. We want to handle it appropriately. All right, let's dig in. Here we go. And it comes to us and says, Dear Hondo, I feel like our 2023 draft class is getting overlooked for the second year stride. They will inevitably make A04, Michael Mayer, Trey Tucker, played as a lot as rookies and re- really impressed. With things presumably starting to slow down for them, excuse me, for that draft class, who do you see making the biggest stride of the year? One of those four I mentioned, I only and I only see three that you mentioned, AO4, Michael Mayer, and Trey Tucker. Uh, what do you see making, who do you see making the biggest stride? One of the four I mentioned, uh, do you, or do you see Byron Young, Corian Bennett, Chris Smith, Amari Bernie, or Jaden Esta Silvera coming out of nowhere and taking a starting job. Thank you, Justin in Andale, Kansas. Justin, I could sit here and and legitimately make a case for all of those people to take a step. And I think it would be fair. But you're asking me, and I want to go back and read your question again, uh, which uh, thing presumably... Which things presumably starting to with things presumably starting to slow down for the draft class? Who do you see making the biggest stride this year? It's it's again, you can make a case for all of them, but if my life depended on it, it would be Aiden or Trey Tucker. Michael Mayer, I certainly would not be shocked at all. Um I guess I, I would be shocked if Nesta or Byron became starters, but not players and contributors. I would be shocked if Jacorian became a starter, but not a contributor. Amari the same way. I feel good about all those players. I still think they're a year away from a money year and making that jump. But AO4, Trey, and Mayer are all starters. So, I again, I would say Aiden, uh, or Trey would be the one that I would think would make the biggest stride forward. Uh, I think Trey Tucker is going to be a superstar and I've seen enough out of Aiden to be convinced he has the potential to be. And if he competes and if he beats all all comers, which will include the rookie and Anthony and, or keeps them off because it's his, he doesn't have to beat him out. He's just to keep staying ahead of them. Um, I guess that is beating him out, but uh, I I think if he can do that, he's going to have a big year. Next one says, Hondo, question, do you agree with me that uh, the round that the Raiders used to, to, uh, to use to draft a quarterback indicates their confidence in A04 as, as a long-term viable starter for the silver and black? Now, he also has a comment I'm going to read you in a minute. Um, and that comes from John uh, Brubaker. No, I don't. And I want to explain why. They believe in Aiden. 
They need to see more, but they absolutely believe in him. But if the right quarterback isn't there, there are there are two quarterbacks that I believe the Raiders would take in the first round. There are some quarterbacks I think the Raiders would take in the fifth. Um, so that's neither indicative of AO4 or non-indicative. It, it's simply um, where a quarterback's value is to get picked. They believe in him. 100% they do. And But if there's somebody that they are convinced has a potential to be a franchise guy, they're going to pull the trigger at one. And if there isn't one there, they'll let it go down. I believe, and we're, we've yet to see, so I'm giving them the benefit of a doubt based on the past and based upon my personal opinion, guided by wisdom, that they will pick a person according to his value. I don't think the Raiders will be making reaches. But I've told you, Many of the best offensive quarterback drafters that I know tell me they wouldn't touch Penix before the third round. Okay. But if the Raiders are convinced he a man, if they're convinced he's the quarterback of the future, they'll pull the trigger before. So no, I don't think that's indicative because it's going to be the person there and how they view the value. Now, many of you have heard me use the word strategery. Um, I love that word. I, I, I knew it came from a comedy sketch, but J John Burbank wrote me this about my use of the word. Um, strategery, strategery, strategery was invented by my stepson, Michael Shore, who wrote a Saturday Night Live, who wrote for Saturday Night Live. It was created for Will Ferrell as former President George Bush in a skit with Daryl Hammond, a, a former VP uh, excuse me, as former VP Al Gore. It was ma it made its way into popular culture. So, John, do me a favor and tell your son-in-law, thank you for inventing that. Uh, I use it and I like it. And you let Michael know I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, Next email. Hello, Hondo. Long-time listener of the show. My question is, how valuable is a fifth-year option for a rookie quarterback? Would it be likely to would you would it be likely to trade up for a late first to take him one day on day one of the draft? I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Brandon Tucker. This is a great question. It's actually a brilliant question. <clears throat> As I hear it all the time. Well, if you're going to take so and so in the first round. I mean, in the second round, you might as well, who's a quarterback, or the third, you might as well run up in the first, you get an extra fifth rounder, okay? But remember, 60% of first-round quarterbacks fail. Only 40% succeed. So if you've, got to, if you've got to take them that much early, what if it ends up being a guy that you don't want the fifth rounder on? Then you wasted the value of a pick. See, too many people, and I'm not attacking you, Brandon, I'm explaining. Too many people, they look at a player or a position and not the value of a pick. I'll give you an example. Years ago, I had a buddy that had a gorgeous sports car that his grandfather had purchased, had under a thousand miles, and his grandfather, a couple of years later, died. My buddy gets this gorgeous sports car and it was a beautiful car and a few years go on he gets married everything's great then the wife gets pregnant she says babe we 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 don't we can't use sports car we got to have a back seat for baby seats and all that stuff all right so he had to get rid of it now follow me for a minute that sports car was valuable and good to him. He wasn't wealthy, but it didn't fit the need. And so when he traded the car in for a minivan, he actually got cash back and got basically got the minivan for free. It was that valuable of a car. But he knew the value of what he needed. If you think a guy is your franchise guy, then yeah, you go up and get him. 
But if there's any doubt, you stay in the second round. The fifth year option is not that valuable if you're not sold. It all goes back to being sold. I've heard some people say, oh, Hondo's throwing shade at Michael Penix. You know, I can't address ignorant people who don't know how to listen, so I don't even try. The point is, I have simply given information of what the best NFL drafters think of Penix. I've told you, great kid. I like him personally. I like him as a quarterback. The four season-ending injuries are a great concern to me and the drafters that I respect. But if the Raiders pick him in the first round, I'm rooting for the guy. I want him to do well. I don't root against people. So my answer to you in a nutshell about the fifth-year option, if you have to give extra up, which is taking somebody where you don't have them valued, for a fifth-year option, you're not sure that you're going to need. Now, use another example. If I'm sitting there in the third round at the 44th pick and the second round of the 44th pick, and I'm 100% that the quarterback I want is coming to me and he's a franchise guy, yes, I'm moving up to 31 to get the fifth-year option. If I'm 100% sure. But remember what Bill Pullian said right here in this podcast. If you're not sure, you got your answer. It all comes down to that. Great question, though, Brandon. Thank you for asking it. Next one comes to us from Chris M. Hi, Hondo. Who are two or three good players at the O-line that would make sense in this draft class? Thanks for everything you do. Well, there's a bunch of them. Um, you may remember, I said this probably a month and a half ago. The record for offensive linemen, I believe, in the first round is five. I think they're going to get as many as ten. Um, Fuaga of Oregon State, physical, beast, tough, mean. Uh, you may remember uh, Al Noga, who was a nose tackle for the Minnesota Vikings. I had a scout that was very involved in in, in getting Al Noga um, on the draft boards. And he told me that Fuaga, even though he's a different position, one was a defensive tackle, one's offensive, plays with that kind of mean. Um, he, not a trash talker like John Randall, but mean like John Randall. Great kid. Just when I say mean, I mean tough as nails on the football field. So Fuaga, J.C. Latham, uh, Alabama, Joe Alt is a, is a really good. Fontu is another really good one. Um, from Penn State, Alt is from Notre Dame, I believe. So there's several of them. Now, you have to also remember who fits your scheme. I think Fawaga is a great fit. He's a great fit. A great fit. Um, if you get a chance to get Fawaga, I'm running the card up the aisle doing cartwheels. Mm. He's a dude and he can play and he's very physical. He can bend um, not only forwards and backwards, but sideways. When you put the film on him and you watch how athletic he is, he's a 330 pound ballerina with strength, just do. I like them, but there's several I like. On two, like them all. Like them, Latham, like them. Waga. <laughs> I like that, and especially where what the Raiders are doing where they're going with this offense uh they want the athletic the big athletic 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 offensive line <clears throat> look that up in the dictionary it says c fuaga here it goes i have so much fun with you guys i hope you know how much i appreciate you 
I really do. I appreciate all of y'all. You are tremendous and wonderful people. Thank you for sharing your, your day with me. Um, Next one comes to some Wayne R. Hi, Hondo. Huge fan of you and the Raiders. What led you to Vegas to cover the Raiders? And do you find it difficult at times to be non-biased when you cover a particular team so closely? Great, uh, great, great, great question. I should have known it with a name like Wayne. My father's middle name was Wayne and my son, Dexter Ernest Wayne. So I should have known that Wayne, but um, let me dig into. So first of all, I was asked, I'd covered the Big Ten for many, many years. Would you be willing to move to Vegas with the Raiders who are um, moving to Vegas to cover them? So that's in a nutshell how that all started. Um, and the, the Raiders were a team that I had told them I would consider leaving the Big Ten for, um, number one. And then number two, I don't find it hard to not be biased. And I want to explain. Um, I have many friends on the team and in the organization, many, who I respect, I like, uh, I admire, and I want them to do well. I root for good people. Um, so I believe since I'm very open, this is part of the reason why I'm so open. And it, it's cost me listeners, people that said, you're not a Raiders fan. I don't want to listen to you. Okay. All right. Go ahead. But I do put that out there to continue to remind myself, my job is to not be biased. My job is to, do I want to see good people succeed? I sure do. I sure do. And, um, but my job is to report on the team. Now, do I like to see good people succeed? I sure do. I sure do. And, um, but I think, because I have so many friends at so many different positions at nearly every team, it allows me to stay grounded. You know, there are friends of mine who are part of the chiefs organization and I enjoy them and I care about them and they're wonderful people. I've got friends that um, I've got one friend um, who very high level executive in an NFL company. And every time his team plays the Raiders, we get together and we're very close. And him and his wife are very close to me and my wife. And we're very, very dear friends. And uh, he knows when I'm rooting for the game, I want good people to succeed. So no, I, it's not hard for me because I keep it forefront. Now I've had people tell me, you need to quit saying you're not a fan. I disagree. <clears throat> I think it makes my podcast different. I respect the Raiders. I care about the Raiders. I want them to succeed. I'm very fond of Raider Nation. And so I'm not ashamed of that at all. But wanting someone to succeed and then rooting for it are two different stories. Two different stories. All right. Good question, though. Thank you, Wayne. Next one comes up from Jeffrey T. Dear Hondo, you've talked about ownership from different teams possibly affecting current members of their staff and front office from doing their jobs. What is that? What is it that ownership does that makes it more difficult to let football people perform their jobs? Do they dictate the direction of the organization without any willingness to adapt? Do they only want to sell tickets and therefore uh, want to keep their star players beyond their market value, having little interest in winning games? Great question. You guys hit it out of the park today on questions, by the way. So, Jeffrey, I'm going to give you a couple examples, different teams. I'm not going to tell you the teams, but I'm going to give you a couple examples. I knew a team that for a long time had a really bad history in the draft. They were not successful. Their franchise was terrible. They didn't succeed. And a general manager comes in, wants to change the direction of the franchise, and wants to go with a very solid pick, who, by the way, became a Hall of Famer. But the owner wanted a particular skill player um, 
and said, this is who the fans really want. It's who they're calling in the radio stations. And But sir, we don't need that position. I know, but it's what the fans want. You know, they're going to be excited. Okay. Everybody's got a boss. I heard a story once about an NFL owner that had a relationship with a particular college and told his owner, I would like you to draft somebody from this college. They don't have a lot of guys drafted. It'll really help them in recruiting. And the guy's like, what? Oh, yeah, just use a late pick. What? Uh, um, I know owners that refuse to let players get cut. No, they're a fan favorite. The fans love them. But we're clearly not producing. Okay. I know owners who say, uh, who jump in on contract negotiations and then come up with deals that really handcuff general managers and salary cap people. So there's a lot of different ways ownership can get in. They can fire coaches and general managers all the time. So no continuity of vision gets established. There's a lot of different ways. And it happens. <clears throat> Next one. Ando, having watched the draft for decades, it never ceases to amaze me how, me how media hype raises stock to a frenzy. High paid executives fall victim every year, resulting in a spectacular, spectacular bust and lost jobs. Question. Who rises this year? Do you, what? Which risers this year do you feel have been artificially propped up by the media and won't pan out? Ooh, that's good. So let me, I'm going to answer this question, but I'm going to go at it from a different angle, if you don't mind. I got to remember who asked it. George C. George C. George, I... Let's use C.J. Stroud, for example. Okay, last year, allegedly, he didn't do good on an IQ-type test. I was told it was leaked by a team that wanted him to drop so they could draft him. Um, not always, but sometimes you'll hear negative buzz. Now... There are a couple things, and I believe that I do a good job of guarding against this, and I'll share with you in a moment how I think I do that. Then it'll be your decision, but um, there are times information gets out there so players will drop. There's also times that, players, that information gets out there because a journalist is able to get it from somebody he really trusts. So let's go back last year. Um, there was a defensive lineman that I was told by many people when the draft process started, Jalen Carter was the best, most talented player in the draft, but also had the most red flags. Okay. And he was falling off draft boards because there was a lot of concern about him. I know that for a fact. That was not hyperbole. I didn't mind writing it because I got it from people. And this goes back to me now to explaining to you how I think I do a good job. I don't mean that arrogantly. Um, I listen to people who I know personally and who transcend the relationship of media and executive or agent. And it's two friends. I listen to those people and I value those people. They know I'm not going to give them poor information and they know that I know they're not going to give it to me. Now, there are times that they'll say to me, Hondo, I can't answer that. And there'll be times, I'll give you a quick one, just the other day. Um, I had a friend call me who knows that I'm friends with another executive, not a Raiders, but another executive. And he said, hey, what do you think they're going to do? And I laughed and he goes, I know you can't tell me. I said, I can't. And I go, and I wouldn't tell them what you, th what you think. And they respect that. Um, that's why when I do my mock drafts, I won't let my friends pick for their teams. That way everybody knows the rules. 
Um, so I only listen to people who I emphatically trust. And they have to be people who are proven, who are, and I tell them, if you try to use me, I don't tell them this now, but when people are coming up the ranks as a, as a source with me, if you lie to me, I'll name you. And so I just, I'm very careful. There are some media who have really, really good relationships. So they get information and they put it out there. Again, I was told that the CJ Stroud stuff um, was strategery, um, trying to get him to drop. Carter, it wasn't. In fact, you can go look. I believe his agent's Drew Rosenhaus, which this is a story for another day if one of you ever emails me about it. Everyone knows Drew Rosenhaus, and most people think that Drew Rosenhaus is not well-liked in the NFL. I've had multiple general managers tell me they would rather deal with Drew Rosenhaus than a lot of agents, um, that he is a terrific agent um, in working with the team. So teams do respect him. I can tell you that. Um, but anyways, you, you, but I believe it was last year, there was a report that Drew Rosenhaus was on the phone almost, you know, begging the Eagles to pick him because they knew if he gets past the Eagles, he's dropping a long ways. So again, those are big things that go into the process. I'm not going to necessarily name some players to you, but I am going to use one example if you don't mind. Sorry, it's hot. <clears throat> um, JJ McCarthy, if you go back and look at my first mock draft this year, um, the general manager, we had we had the Raiders taking him the, in their, their first pick of the second round. And I wrote this, said by the time the draft gets here, I'll, I'll be shocked if he's not in the top three. Um, and he goes, but if the draft were today, you could get him in the second round. McCarthy's driving up, and that's not false. The best drafters have been on McCarthy since the uh, Alabama game. And then after his pro day, everybody got on. Um, I have a very dear friend of Shannon and I's. I mean, very dear. Um, I bet we go to dinner four or five times a year. And uh, we're very close as families, not just, just as a couple, our children and stuff. Um, and he told me that J.J. McCarthy had the best pro day of any quarterback he had ever seen. And he goes back a long ways, a long ways. Um, he just said it was just amazing, pinpoint accuracy. He goes, it wasn't accuracy with an open receiver with no defensive back. It was putting the ball in and and they did he did some drills all right let me go back i should probably explain to you pro days so the quarterback throw does a lot of drills from the middle of the field and you know he's doing out routes and sevens and posts and everything else and flag routes but he was doing routes up against the sideline where it had to be pinpoint accurate because he wanted to show his accuracy he wasn't hiding in the middle of the field where there's no defensive back Ooh, he threw the ball the guy caught it Ooh, no he was doing drills where there's a window. This one guy told me there was about an eight inch window, which is tight even in the NFL. And he said, he just drilled the guy in his hands, just drilled it. So he had a great pro day. So he's rising because that's what people are talking about. Media in this business don't pipe someone up and get guys to make the picks. Um, I think even the guys that I would consider the worst in the draft, media guys, I don't think do that. Somebody's telling them. Now, I think a lot of them get played, but somebody's telling them that. And so, again, I, I'm not going to get into anyone, into anyone right now. I may next week because I'm going to get a lot more detailed in the draft next week. But I would just tell you, I think that's how that all goes down. And, and I know how that's how it goes down for me. And it's how I'm, I'm, I try to be careful for you. So thanks a lot for that. Um, really appreciate that question. Thank you. Um, it says, Hondo, um, 
For the 24 draft, do you have any surprises that you're thinking or hearing about? It never goes the way people think, and they are exciting, and they're, they're exciting, and that's the exciting part. A surprise I am qualifying as something that is being talked about or uh, goes much differently than current consensus. Thank you. God bless John M. I actually do. I have not been able to verify this, so I am not going to tell you what it is. And it's not Raiders. Um, I have heard that there is a team that is actively shopping a major player to move up in the draft. A major player. Um, I think a lot of you would be shocked. So I have heard it. I haven't heard it from more than one person. I heard it from somebody I trust, but I haven't heard it from more than one person. And I like to, you know, I love your saying in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So I like to get more than one. I mean, I trust that it was legitimate because of the person who told me. But yeah, I think there could be some interesting developments. Now, you never know. I hear about trades all the time where I get it verified from two or three teams. Again, the Raiders looked at trades. Nothing was imminent, but they're still looking. People look at trades all the time. That's the nature of the business. Um, but if this deal goes down, that would be a, a big deal. Next. Um, this comes from Lion M. Do you think if the Raiders started winning, their, the issues people see with fan attendance will disappear or will the rivalry always be there and the point is mute? Now, we saw about the rivalry with the Bay and with Las Vegas. I'm going to tell you this. Raider fan will show up for a team that shows up. You don't even think it's got to be a Super Bowl contender. Remember how Allegiant was last game last year? Remember how Allegiant was? Um, it was different after AP took over. Now, there were some games that were already sold a lot to, to visiting teams, so they still had a lot. But even the atmosphere was different. Do you remember go back to Rich Bisaccia, last game of the year against the Bolts? If they win it, they're in the playoffs. That crowd was all Raider. Now it helped they're playing the Chargers. And as Mark Davis says, I think he calls it their five fans. But the point is, absolutely, I don't think there'll be any issue. But the Raiders have to produce. The Raiders move to Vegas, so they move away. It's very expensive because the stadium is sold out on the secondary market. It's not cheap to go to Raider game at, at Allegiant. So, yeah, I think it's – it, but – if the Raiders are putting a product that is commiserate with cost, people will be there. I'm going to tell you something. I've only covered Raider Nation five years. Now, you guys have done a very good job as silver and black missionaries, winning over a lot of my family, several of my children. And, uh, of course, my wife and Dexter are huge. Um, every time I tell my wife I'm, I'm going to go do my podcast, she always says, remember, I'm like, what? Raiders. Um, but I will tell you that uh I Raider Nation, man, I I believe in them. They're gonna be there. I I told someone a couple weeks ago, maybe a month, I said, one thing you never have to worry about, Raider Nation. You show up, they'll show up. It's not a life. It's it's not a fandom. It's a lifestyle. They live it every day. Every day, but every day they show up. Every day they're there. Every day, Raider Nation, they're the best for a reason. You even you put a competitive product out there that's fighting. That's representing. That's, no, that's not a Hondo term, but that's that's kids like to use the term represent. They'll be there. They're the most loyal fan base. 
across all economic divides, all politics, all races, all genders, all everything, all religions, traitor nation. You be like them, which is just show up, do your job, hard work and lunch pail folk. They'll be there. Next. Uh... Nick Z, my question is about the draft. I hear not only you, but a lot of people talk about the success rate of picking a solid quarterback in the first round being around 50%. It's actually 40, but pretty close. I've looked into the past 20 years or so, and I would agree. Offensive linemen seem to be the best at 70% success. When you look at the numbers, is the QB really that much of a risk? Compared to other players, Nick Z, absolutely it is for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, I don't know where you got your stats, but I can tell you um, drafting is an art. And the reason there are so many failures is because there are so many teams that don't know how to draft. They take risks. So I would say this on – any draft this year or 20 years from now, the Lord wills, and I'm still the beat writer covering the Raiders. You don't take risks in the first round, but you get a lot of people take a lot of risks. Okay. Okay. Yeah, whatever you say, it's what you think and you go do it. But when it fails, you don't take risks. Now, there are times that you do. Maybe there's a guy that a lot of people don't like, but you got some inside information that his offensive coordinator didn't really like him. And I, I, I knew of a situation where a player was out and this is not a Raider situation, by the way, it was a college situation, but a Raider, a, 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 not a Raider, again, not Raider, but a player, not a Raider, a player, college player, um, got hit on by a coach's wife. And he didn't do anything, man. He kept it alone. So the wife tells the husband he made a pass at me. And there was all kinds of dissension. The player didn't get used much. People, oh, yeah, yeah, he he really fell off. But a team got information. Hey, this is a good kid. Understood the situation. Nabbed him. Maybe you've got that. But good drafting teams know how to do their investigation. They know how to look at a ton of details. They know how to check everything. I'll give you another one. So years ago, Brian Hoyer um, was coming out of college. He had had 70 passes drop that were catchable balls. Very accurate thrower in college. And for people that are Brian Hoyer haters, I'm friends with Brian. You know that. I've never hidden that from you because I didn't. I wanted to protect you in case I was being biased. But... You know, the guy played 14 years in the NFL and made tens of millions of dollars. And I always laugh because I bet most of his critics, he made more than them and he played pro football. So the pro football teams thought he was worth something. Again, his career at Raiders was not good. But I'm, I'm speaking in generalities. So the Patriots loved him. Bill Belichick loved him because he was so accurate. Gets them, keeps them for years. Why? They had good information. It all comes down to, I don't think it's position. I think it's there's teams that take too many risks. Too many risks. You just knew. When Tony Mandrich came out of Michigan State, I think I don't remember he was third, fourth, fifth pick, maybe second pick in the NFL draft um, by Green Bay. He dominated in college, but people knew there's some concern with Tony. 
Okay. Packers didn't care and picked him. And you could call him an absolute bust pick. But in the, you know, another round, he wouldn't have been a bust, but good teams did their research investigation and they understood. So again, I think it comes down to being a good drafting team, picking the player of value. Again, now the closer you get to the bottom of the draft, it's a different story. But the higher the pick, the stronger the need for that one to hit. I would take more risks in the second and third round. Mm -hmm. Unless there are guys there that I got first round value on that fall into the second. And every year it happens. Every year it happens. I, I know of six or seven teams ahead Michael Mayer with a top of the first half grade last year. Now, there were a lot of bad draft picks last year. So a bunch of those type of players fell. And the Raiders did everything they could to get up to get Michael Mayer, which was a great draft pick. But those are the type of situations. So you're sitting there in the second. Okay, yeah, I'll take a risk on this guy. But, oof, there's four or five guys there that I still had first-round grades on. So I would start maybe taking more risks in the second. If I'm a general manager, I'm not taking risks in the first round. And it is very difficult if you're a good drafter to not find first round talent or to be able to trade out and just say, you know what? I don't have anybody right now of value at this spot. I'm trading. Now, that takes discipline. If you're a rebuilding team and you know you need players, well, everyone's going to want me to use my first rounder, but <laughs> I really like, some guys in the second, but I'm not sure if they're first round value. It takes discipline. I'll get more into that in a minute. Next one comes to us from Alex O. My question for you is, have you noticed that the free agents, coaches that AP has brought in were primarily from teams that he saw after he took over as head coach? Wilkinson from Miami. Madison from Minnesota, uh, Minshew, Getsy, et cetera. All people he saw up close and personal in tough losses, and I'm wondering if that's a common thread around the NFL or something more telling of AP as a coach. That's a really good question, Alex. I, I don't think at all that all of it is related to them beating the Raiders. Um, but I think – some of them fit places of need and he was impressed with how they beat him for sure. Um, and having not been a coordinator or been in the NFL for long, he didn't have an, a lot of time to build up relationships. And AP is a very smart football savvy guy. And he knows my eyes don't lie to me. So what he sees, he trusts. That's why you like to hear him say, my resume is on the field. He likes people that he knows are already producers and why. So I don't think everyone got hired because of that, but I certainly don't think it hurt them. Now, next one comes from Stephen Lisa in San Antonio, Texas. I was just there a few weeks ago. Beautiful, beautiful city. Our question is, since you have so much knowledge about the team, as one of the major beat writers, and in our opinion, the best one too, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Could you tell us, the fans, your biggest concern about this year's team? What is something you are really watching that we too, as fans, need to watch too? Steve and Lisa and San Antonio. What a great question. By the way, Steve and Lisa, if you're ever looking for a great restaurant in San Antonio, it's all over Texas, but the best Mexican restaurant in the world, bar none, in America, by the way. I guess I should say in America. The best Mexican restaurant is Papacitos. Mm. Get the quail, get the grilled quail and the queso cheese and the tortillas. Oh, 
I may have to get a plane. <laughs> My wife and I, every year on her birthday, we catch a plane to Texas in the morning, have lunch at Papacitos, dinner at Papacitos, and then fly home that night. And uh, just go eat at Papacitos and thank me later. It's really, really good. All right. So, yes, there is a concern. And I'm going to tell you what it is. Um, the Raiders are never going to be good again until there's stability, stability in ownership, stability in coaching, stability in the management team, the right roster, all of that. And what happens that I've noticed, and I've covered other teams, and and some of them um, can be critical for sure, but I've never seen anything like the Raiders. They will just turn on their own. Um they and I understand they haven't been good in so long in the franchise. It's the franchise's fault because they sell the fans just win. I don't think the Raiders are a Super Bowl team next year. I do think they're a playoff team, but I don't think they're a Super Bowl team. And I just think fans need to take a deep breath and let this team develop. It's going to be the first year for Antonio Pierce. Um, intern doesn't count. He didn't have a staff. He was down two coaches, no trade deadlines, no OTAs, no mini camps, no training camp, nothing. And it's going to be his first year. There's going to be some learning pains. There's going to be some adjustments. They're bringing a new system on offense. This is, there's going to be some, there's going to be some adjustments here. And invariably you watch. In fact, if y'all remind me, I'll do this. On Twitter, somewhere probably in the first quarter, maybe the second quarter, third quarter, fourth, but sometime in the first game, someone's going to write, this team sucks, terrible hire with AP. They're going to know that in game one because they want to have the big take to be able to go back and show everybody the tweet. Look, it, I said this in the first game. I said it. I was the first. When I was a kid, we would say, take a chill pill. Relax. Let it unfold. Let it develop. I don't know if you could hear Dexter's in the other room playing football and you just said, read. <laughs> um, but let, I, I'm not even a Raider fan, Stephen Lisa, and I'm so tired of watching this fan base fight each other, attack each other. I mean, everyone talks about you know, Raider Nation's family. And when you're out in those parking lots at those those uh, um, tailgates, it is that way. But it's like they get in the building. And I don't get it. I don't understand it. Now, maybe the people that are that way aren't out there tailgating. But that's where some of you need to calm some of these people down. Hey, you know what? It's the first game. Shut up. Relax. Take a, take a pill. I remember years ago, I was watching a scrimmage. It was Kirk Cousins' first scrimmage at Michigan State. And whether you like Kirk or not, he's gone on and made a ton of money in the NFL, and he was really good. And so I'm sitting in the stands watching. I'm a media member, but I'm sitting in the stands watching it. Now. I've known Kirk a long time. I know his parents, his brother, wonderful people, precious people. And I'm sitting there with a, another parent. And Kirk drops back, throws the ball, hits the ground. And this guy yells out, Oh, you suck. No wonder nobody wanted you, and we were able to get you at the end of the recruiting. You suck. At a scrimmage. And I remember I took my sunglasses off, and, and I looked over at the guy, and I go, shut up. Shut up. It's a scrimmage. It's, it's a closed scrimmage. He's a freshman. Give the kid a break. Some let your team develop a little bit. I mean, how stupid do Chiefs fans look? Who last year, when the Raiders went into their house on Christmas Day and 
thumped them, booing your team. Booing your team. If you were booing your team that team on Christmas Day and you're not a Raider and you're a Chief fan, then you better not be cheering at a Super Bowl. Come on now. It's not family. It's not family. My wife gets to enjoy some great times in my life, but guess what? She was faithful when times weren't great. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being critical with your team after the season to go back and really be analytical and look at things. But what does it gain for you to go on social media and trash your own players? I've seen Raider fans tweet at Raider players or, or Instagram them. Trash them. Are you going to go to your kid's baseball game and boom? them? Yet you claim to be a family? My belief has always been you let the year play out, and then you look at the year, and you be analytical, and you be tough. You be tough. You all know how I am. Every coach I cover gets 20 games when they start. And this is going to be AP's first season. So it starts now. He gets 20 games before I'm going to be tough on him. Why? Going to have to get his guys. He's going to have to. I'm, I'm, I guarantee you. I almost, almost would guarantee you the staff next year is not going to be the staff he has this year. He's going to work through some things. He's a new coach. There's going to be some adjustments. Let him adjust. Let him adjust. You are never going to be successful as a franchise. Ever. If it's just constant turmoil. Again, I'm not preaching at you, but the Bible says a house divided against itself can't stand. There's a lot of people in Raider Nation who I am convinced enjoy hating Raider Nation. It's almost fun for them. Something's going to happen. Somebody's going to rip Mark Davis. Okay, you're going to rip him. The guy that just spent tens of millions to get rid of a coach that he didn't have to. That's leadership. And I just, I don't care who they pick. They need to ride this train. They got to get on the on, on the course of stability. By the way, if you only watch this video on SI or on YouTube and you don't, um, you can check out the audio at Apple or at Spotify. I do an additional podcast every day called Riding with Hondo and Dexter. It's an audio exclusive only. It's usually four to six minutes. I started a series yesterday. Today's day two. Um, I was recently having dinner with a very successful NFL person, and I asked this person, "What makes the uh, what makes a healthy NFL team?" And the person said to me, um, "Gave me five things to know if your team is healthy." I would suggest, and it, it's going to be. It was yesterday and today, and then. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm sorry, it'd be four days. Um, but go listen to those five things. But one of them is is that is the biggest concern I have. I have seen Raider players who lost confidence, and we're just getting crushed by Raider fans. I've seen it since I've been here, and again. I have no problem with people being critical. That's my job. But you can say to someone they effed up without calling them an F up. You can say to somebody, I'm really disappointed you screwed up. But that's different than saying to them, you're a screw up. And I just think sometimes if Raider Nation could ever, I mean, it is so big. If you could ever even get 70% of you going in one direction. This, this franchise would be fantastic every year. Now, sometimes the franchise hasn't done anything to give you a reason to cheer. And that's on them. But you got a new direction, a new coach, a coach that the majority of fans wanted, not everyone, but the majority. 
You got a new general manager. Most of you wanted a general manager who had separate authority than the coach. You got that. And I think that's a brilliant move. I think Tom Telesco has done every single thing right this offseason. We're going to find out over time. But guess what? Tom Telesco is going to screw up. Antonio Pierce is going to screw up. Aiden O'Connell is going to screw up. Max Crosby is going to screw up. Judge it after the year. That's my opinion. You asked for it, Steve and Lisa, so there you go. Um, Jim Craig from the Philippines emails in. You were just talking about Mark Davis' involvement. It seems to me that many feel he has mediocre. He has a mediocre understand. I think he means understanding of the game, uh, game not team. But I suspect he knows a lot more than uh, we give him credit for. Have you ever talked football with him? And if so, what is your impression? Um, I have talked with him. Um, I think that Mark Davis, one of his strengths, and I think it's a real strength, is he knows what he doesn't know. And he's very open about it. Mark does not try to pull the wool over your eyes that he's his dad. Now, he also doesn't remind you of the places where he's far better than his father, which is as a businessman. He's far better than his dad as a businessman. So to his credit, he tells you where he's not as good as his dad and never tells you where he's better, which is what you want a son to be. Um, I think Mark knows the game. I do. Um, I don't have enough um, information to turn to tell you if I think he understands all of the X's and O's. But I think he understands a lot of it. I think he's got a really good understanding. And I could name several owners in the NFL who I think probably have a significantly less understanding than him. So, um, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think Mark knows more than people give him credit for. This next one comes up from Andrew B. from Alabama. Hondo, hope you're well. Uh, plenty of mocks have Penix going to the Raiders at 13, and plenty have him going at 44. Quite the gap between those two picks. Do you believe he is more likely to go as high as 11 to 13 or as low as the second round, or does the truth lie somewhere in the middle? Thanks, Andrew from Alabama. Great question. Again, the people that I trust have a third round grade on them. They all love him as a man. They love him as a quarterback, but it's all because of the injury history. I will be stunned if he doesn't go in the first round. I will be stunned. It will be. But I think there's too much shiny on him. Uh, somebody will, will, will take him in the first or second round. I think in the first. I don't think any way Penix gets out of the second. Even though, and so whatever team takes him before that, I hope he hits. He's a great kid. You guys would all love him. Great kid. But I, I, that's what my prayer and hope is for him. Next, just wondering if you think the Raiders will try to extend, lock up Patrick Graham for the next few seasons. As I understand it, he is on the last year of his con current contract. I know we could get a compensatory pick for him if he left for a head coaching position, but don't think that uh, is nearly as valuable as his, as he is to us uh, leading our D. Thanks, Hondo. I have a wonderful day. Kev W. Well, first of all, even if they did lock him up to a long-term deal, he is allowed to go interview for head coaching jobs. So if I was the Raiders, I would give him a very big extent, a deal extension, give him security and treat him so well that he didn't want to go. But most guys want to be head coaches. And if he gets that chance, he's going to take it. But yeah, I give him the big deal. Just because I think you pay people who deserve it. Remember, I told you I had a general manager who said he would look at his staff every year and say to his head coach, all right, let's look at your offensive line coach. How many other people want to hire him? Well, nobody. And if there's not an extenuating circumstance, then who are we going to replace him with? Because he believed you want the staff everybody else wants. I think you give him a big deal just to let him know how much we value and how good you treat him. Next comes from John H. 
Hi, Hondo. A Raider fan here in the beautiful country of, of uh, Cumbria in the north of England, UK. My question is, what would Max Crosby and the other players who are working out do when they're in the facility? Is it all gym work, skill work, specific to position, watching film? I would be fascinated if you could break down a day of training a top Raider player has to do to compete at this level to make they, to me, they all seem like superhumans. Can't wait for the new season to start. My game pass is uh, renewed. Thanks for all the hard work and insight, John H. Great one. Hey, good to talk to you, John. Hope everybody in England's doing well. So let me address this first of all, because no day is the same. Yes, they get in, they do gym work, or they'll run and that kind of stuff. But remember, none of it's organized by the team. Now, I do believe strength and conditioning coaches can be in there, but I may be wrong on that. But I do think that's the case. But if they see a coach, it's simply a greeting. Hey, how are you? I hope you're doing well. How's the family? Great. Hey, did you go to the show last night? Whatever. But um, there's also they can go and they can get medical. Um, they eat there and get get the food, you know, good food and and. They can spend time with one another. There really isn't. Every day is not the same. Every day is different. But yes, every day is going to include some facet of conditioning, weightlifting. They can use the pools, whatever, medical, all that, John. And, and I wish there was one specific way to describe a day, but that's not that that's not how it works. Next one comes with some Michael Brooks. Question is Mark Davis approve both Tom and AP moving up in this year's draft to draft a quarterback. Yeah, I've been reporting this um, since the general manager interviews were going on. There's full approval to go up for any player that they feel that they need. I don't know why I'm getting a lot of these emails, but I am. But those of you that listen all the time know I've been telling you that for months. Uh, Matt A, will you be be in the building do you get uh will you be in the building um will you get anywhere near the war room or do you play it as or do you play it as just wait and see and ask questions after the draft uh to your podcast listeners matt no will not be in the war room yes absolutely in the building um talking to people all the time last year i got some texts and i i even wrote about um, certain picks that brought great joy to the war room because I was told by people who had, had access to it. But yes, we'll be in the building, interviewing players, management, whatever. Um, but no, not in the war room. The media does not go in the war room. So there you go, everybody. Please follow us on IG at Hondo SR. Please also make sure you follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. When you go to at Hondo Carpenter, go to si.com forward slash NFL forward slash Raider. And remember, Raiders, and remember, if you don't want to look at me, and I don't blame you, you can always listen when you go to Spotify or you go to um, Apple and look for the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast with Hondo Carpenter. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you, everybody. Appreciate you very much.